couple of weeks, next two weeks, talking about the book of James. And we're going to do what you know as expository. There's two kinds of Bible teaching that you can do. You can do topical or you can do expository. So expository, the next two weeks, I want you to kind of put your thinking cap on. I want you to kind of feel like you're in a classroom. And we're going to study this book. Um, I might not get as many shouts, but something's going to get in you that's going to change you because I will read every verse. And when you read every verse in the Bible, it goes into your heart, right? We put it in the atmosphere. And there's so many truths in these verses, and that's why at times we'll go through a whole book of the Bible. Then three weeks from today, we're going to start a brand new topical series called Who Discipled You? And it's going to be good. And don't forget, is it next Sunday's Mother's Day? Oh, that's important. I better mark that. But um, next Sunday, we'll have a gift for all the moms. And um, if you're glad to be here, say amen. amen. So excited. Now, I love the Bible. I love everything about it. I'm a word guy. I love, I love my worship, but my first love is the scriptures. And, you know, this book, we all know it well. It's only five chapters it's a great book to take a couple of weeks to go through. And the book of James, there's really two guys in the New Testament named James. One is James, a disciple of Jesus, but he did not write this book because he had passed by the time this book was written. This book was written by the brother of Jesus. And most believe the brother of Jesus, James, was not converted during Jesus's uh, earthly ministry. And I thought, that's got to have been a tough burden to carry. You show up at the party, hey, this is James, the brother of the Son of God. You know, that, that's a tough burden to carry. Can I get an amen? That's a lot to live up to. But most theologians believe James, the brother of Jesus, was converted after Jesus' resurrection. And then he became a pillar in the church, a pillar in the Jewish church, and he uh, became a pastor of pastors. He was nicknamed James the Just. And when you read his words, there's very little anesthesia. Can I get an amen? He just puts it right out there. And um, he speaks very directly. And so the letter is addressed to the 12 tribes uh, among, scattered among the nations, the verse one will say. But it's really for, it was written kind of like Peter you know, most of Paul's letters are written to a specific church, the church in Ephesus, the church in Philippi, the church in Galatia. We know how that works, but oftentimes the book of Peter and the book of James is written to the scattered church. These guys are being persecuted. They were being attacked for their faith. And so in many ways, this letter was for Jews and Gentiles that were converted by the work of Jesus on the cross and now they had become the New Testament church. So it's written from a pastor's heart. And you read James, it's much more emphasis on application than theology. It has some theology in there, but it's really so practical. That's why it's good to read through it. And really the biggest theme from James is faith and works. How do they fit together? How do they fit together? What comes first? And, and does faith, does works, or works necessary to authenticate that your salvation is real? And we'll answer those questions today. If you're with me, say amen. All right, we're going to read 18 verses. So James 1, 1 through 18. I hope you got your thinking cap on. You're ready. It says, James, a servant of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. And James says, perseverance has to finish its work. And as a result, you'll be mature and complete, not lacking anything. But if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all, without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when we ask, he asks that you must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, 
blown back and forth by the wind. The, that man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded and unstable in all he does. He goes on to say, the brother in humble circumstances should take pride in his position, but the one who is rich should take pride in his low position. Now, we're going to see this over and over. There was a big problem in the church with treating wealthy people different than people who were poor. And this goes all the way back before Jesus' ministry, and this was something that irked James. He comes back to it over and over with strong language, and he even tries to reduce the self-importance in the minds of those wealthy people. Like his words here, he says, because he will pass the wealthy like a wildflower, for the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossoms fails and, and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich man will fade away over time while he goes about his business. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial because when he has stood the test, he'll receive the crown of life that God has promised those who love him. Now here comes the third part. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when by his own evil desires he's dragged away and enticed. And after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. Then sin, when it is full blown, gives birth to death. Don't you see, my dear brothers, that every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father, of heavenly lights who does not change like the shifting shadows. He chose to give birth through the word of truth that we might be kind of his first fruits of all that he created. Somebody say amen. It's so good to read the Bible. Now, there's three parts in here. The first part has to do with trials. Everybody say trials. <laughs> they can beat you down. They can set you back. They can discourage you. But here's the twist. He's not talking about trials that can do a negative thing to you. He's talking about it in a positive sense. It sounds like what it does is so critical for my life that I cannot capture these things and develop these things inside of me any other way other than going through trials. Now follow the sequence. He says, when you face trials of many, everybody say many <laughs> kinds. So this is not just a typical day James is talking about. It's not just a typical season. I think we all agree that it's almost never a time in my life where I don't have some kind of trial going on. It doesn't matter how good I can have all these good things and I'm living out of that, but I don't know about you, but there's always something I'm going through. So that's not what he's talking about. He's saying when there are many trials at one time. Have you been there? Are you there right now? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> you know, I'm talking about when both cars break down. Can I get an amen? And the dishwasher. You know, I'm talking about when all the kids are sick. I'm talking about when the boss and the coworkers are giving you problems when you got lots of health issues going on at one time. And when this comes on us, this guy's crazy. He says, don't get down, get happy, get joyful. Because if you keep your head, if you fight through, if you'll maintain control of our mouths and our actions in the midst of all those things coming against you, like Lisa said, there's a well being dug inside of you and something is going deeper, a deep work of the Lord. This will develop something in you that is critical for success in every area of your life, and that thing is perseverance. Everybody say perseverance. It is persistence in doing something despite difficulty or delay in achieving success. You know, and, and we all have this, you know, planting a church. 80% of church plants in America still fail. It doesn't matter how many gifts tests you go through. It doesn't matter how much money you tap from your denomination. 
Most of them fail. It's just very hard to do. And we've had to learn that planting a church over 25 years, starting with eight people, was very, very difficult. Building a great marriage, it takes time. It takes perseverance. We watched these guys at the NFL draft um, last week, and all these guys, they're weeping, they're crying, because since they were eight years old, they've been building this. But you, did you know that NFL quarterbacks that every, the top 10, if you're an NFL quarterback picked in the top 10, that usually means you're guaranteed for success, you would think. You've taken the Wonderlick test. You've done all these things. Only one out of five are still in the league after five years. The ones picked in the top 10, they are unable to persevere and get to that point of success. So James says, that when you get in these trials, it may take a while. It may take a long time for you to work through them because, but he gives us context, because something is happening deep inside you, this process of perseverance. But when you're done, <coughs> only God can determine when that is. I still have a little bit of a cough, but it's not as bad. It's just I'm not used to talking so much. Bear with me. Can I get an amen? Amen. Um, we'll be out by four o'clock. So um, it, it, he says, you will be mature and complete, not lacking anything. How do you want that in your life? The hard part, but well, when we lift our hand, the stark reality is this is the only way, according to James, it comes about. You see, to do what God has called you to do in your life, to do what I'm called to do, I have to become a finisher. Jesus is the author and finisher of my faith. And we must do that to stay married, to raise children, to build a career, to build a church, to finish your degree, to get in shape, whatever in life is on your heart right now and you feel like it's difficult, do not quit. Because something is happening in you that is even bigger than the thing you're working on. It is, I used to say it, what is happening is not what's going on. <laughs> what is happening, there's always something bigger going on with God. There's something deeper. There's something significant that he's doing in us. He's always preparing us for the next thing. So we're learning to persevere in the little so we might be ready for the lot when we get there. So he comes back to it even in verse 12 and says, we will persevere on your trial, we will become mature and complete, and you will receive the crown of life in the next season. Then he talks about the wisdom of God in verses five through eight. How many of you are thankful for the grace of God? Hallelujah. That even if I get myself in a jam from my own stupidity, my own whatever, God having the heart of a father, if I just turn to him in the midst of my mess and ask him to give me wisdom, James says he will give it to you generously without finding fault. Somebody shout hallelujah to that. I mean, that is such the heart of a loving father. But if you think about it, your kids, they'll get in a mess if they come to you. That's what means so much. If they'll just come and God has the same heart, if they'll just say, man, I need your help. You always want to help them because you sense that it's genuine. So that's the first thing, but here's the catch. God has one requirement. When we come to him and say, God, I desperately need your wisdom in this circumstance. I need to know what to do about this relationship, this job offer, this whatever, now, here's the good news. The one requirement is not perfect behavior because we can't give him that. You know what the one requirement is? Faith. He says the one thing you have to do is don't doubt me because when you doubt me, you become unstable in everything in your life. Your thinking becomes confused and you become unstable in your actions. As a matter of fact, James says you'll become double-minded in everything that you're doing. It's interesting, God says that person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord because the currency in God's economy is 
not perfection. It's not mistake-free living. That's not what God wants from you or demands from you. The currency in God's economy is faith. It is a battle of believing and staying faithful to God and knowing that he is your source. And I don't care if, I'm, if you pull the ripcord too quick and jump to this thing or that thing. I'm telling you, man, God is faithful. Can I get an amen? He will bring you through your situation. So God says, come to me. I'm not going to beat you up about your mistakes. I'm not going to wear you down with that. But all I ask is don't doubt me. Don't come to me and two weeks later, when I haven't done what you think I should do, you run off to the next thing. And so we've got to get that in our heart. That is a fair deal from God. Because what oftentimes is, what happens? Man, it just doesn't happen as quick as we think it should happen. And we start doubting. And we want to look to people. We want to look to our gifts and talents. We want to look to our connections to get us out of the situation. James is saying, don't look to those things. Just look to God who has wisdom uh, you need and answers that you need. But it must be of a single heart and a single mind. It can't be looked to God, and if he doesn't give us what we want, we bail on him. you got to have a made-up mind this morning of who your source is. God is my answer. God is where my provision will come from. It doesn't mean you won't, connections won't help you, but my connection will come through the hand of God. It won't be my own manipulation making it happen. Amen? Now, the third part of this passage is temptation and sin that James talks about. This passage we've used so many times to teach and put a theological frame around sin and those four stages of sin. You know, you, you, you're tempted. Desire is conceived in your heart for something that violates God. You act on that sin, and then if you don't repent and turn away, that sin becomes habitual, and that sin becomes death. And we know that that's the pattern in life. But I just want to focus on one part for a couple minutes, and that is the first part, and that is temptation. You know, God says he does not tempt us, but he will allow you to be tempted to see what's inside of you. Because God is always trying to find out your spiritual location. And the only way he can do that is by letting you get in the midst of something and see how we're going to react. And so he uses this with temptation. God pulls us forward through allowing us to experience that and Satan attacks us to move us backwards. Now, temptation, I like this definition. Anything that promises satisfaction at the cost of obedience to God. That is what temptation is. Things out in front of us this morning that just are promising so much. But deep in my gut, I know that if I reach out for this thing, whatever it is, it's going to cause me to have to be disobedient to God. And so we sit in that stage, that first stage knowing as a believer that the sequential order will lead to death, the key is learning how to handle temptation. If we can handle temptation, then so many of our other problems will never come into play. So what is your greatest temptation this morning? You know, I can tell you some people, it's a substance because I know enough about people's business to know there are people in a crowd this size that are struggling with a substance. It's a bottle you want to drink. It's something you want to smoke. It's a pill you want to swallow because God has set you free and the enemy is tempting you to go back. For some, it can be lust, constantly looking and thinking about things that fuel the wrong sexual energy in your life as a Christian, not this precious gift that God gives us between man and wife. For some, it's a critical spirit. I mean, your temptation is to criticize everything from your city, your government, your church, your spouse, your church members, the education system. I mean, and, and, and if we give into that, we become very dogmatic, we become very condescending. And if someone doesn't come to our conclusions, we get frustrated. For some, it can be material things. That's our temptation, 
That credit card is smoking in your wallet right now because you've been giving into that temptation, right? You've been watching the shopping network. And, and, uh, and, and so uh, Amazon, they, they don't have to look up your address. Can I get a witness in here? They're like, yeah, we're going there again. We go there twice a day, right? With pocketbooks and shoes and, and, and golf clubs or whatever it might be. Um, you know, we know we shouldn't care. As Christians, that much about clothes and cars and houses and image, but we're drawn and tempted by it. That's our weakness, struggling to find contentment with what we have, and it gets us in debt. It causes stress. Maybe yours is anger. You know, you, you sit here, honestly, you say, I've got a short fuse. And when you get angry, you say things to people you love, and we say things we shouldn't. We might even curse at them in a moment of anger. And you know what? If that's your weakness, the devil knows how to press your buttons, doesn't he? And get under your skin to try to get you to give in to that. Maybe it's worry and fear. In America today, that's a huge temptation. No matter how hard we try to live, we just battle this fear and worry you know, about things. We react in fear. We know it's out of balance. We're afraid of crime. We're afraid the economy's going in the tank. We're afraid something's gonna happen to our children. We're afraid of being alone. We're afraid of flying on a plane, afraid of going out at night. Every ache and pain is something serious in our body. So I'm just throwing these out. Maybe those are your temptation. Now, let me give you three little things to help with your temptation because it's never going away. (laughs) We live in a fallen world. So these things are around us. So we have to learn how to react. We have to learn, what's the old saying? An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. That's why we gotta win in the stage of temptation. Number one, it is not a sin to be tempted. You gotta understand that. Because right from the get-go, the devil's gonna start condemning you. How dare you even think about that? How dare you even consider that? You loser, you're, you're not even worthy to go to church this morning. I know how he works on you. But Hebrews 4.15, listen to this, says, We do not have a high priest. He's talking about Jesus, who is unable to empathize with their weaknesses. But we have one who was tempted in every way, just as you are yet and did not sin. You see, every time you're tempted, Jesus knows what you're feeling. And you can pray and you can cry out to him and say, Jesus, I need help with this. These thoughts I'm having, these feelings I'm having. And so it's just part of life and it's being Part of being a Christian, we have to know it's coming and be able to maintain our victory. Number two, this is important. Never think you're above temptation. Write this down. Guard against a self-confidence that leads to careless living. Don't get so, what what did Joseph do when Potiphar's wife tried to jump his bones? He ran out the door. He didn't stand there and say, you woman, of I can resist you. You know, she's stroking his hair. He said, I'm getting out of here. I'll run, I'll run, and I won't look back. Because you ne- should never, Corinthians 10, 12. So you think you're standing firm. Be careful you don't fall. Guard against a self-confidence that can lead to a careless life. Live scared so many sins are just sins of opportunity and if we get careless and we think we're above temptation and we can go anywhere and do anything uh, uh, pastor jason i could just spend hours telling you heartbreaking stories of people that just lived a careless life and the enemy got a hold of them because they gave them a clear runway into their life because they got overconfident in who they were Number three is this. This is important, guys. There's always a way out of temptation. Always. The Bible promises me this. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says, And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. God does not tempt us, but yes, sometimes he does let us be tempted to establish our spiritual location. We are surrounded by potential temptation all the time. So let me give you this phrase that has helped me over the years, being tempted. And that is this, every temptation is an invitation 
to depend on God. Every time I feel tempted, I'm at a crossroads. And I can go down that temptation, and sometimes I have. And, and, I, and I let desire be conceived. We go, you know, I, I might act, uh, that desire being conceived, if I don't abort that desire, then I may, because we know that life begins at conception, right? So when desire is conceived, is the desire birthed in me that will cause me to do something that disobeys God. And then from there, if I act on it, well, then I can repent and I can walk away. And that happens. You say things, you do things we shouldn't say. But if we let it sit there even still and it becomes a habit, the Bible says it will give birth to death. Death of something in your life. The whole key is winning at level one. And every temptation <coughs> is an invitation to depend on God. Somebody shout hallelujah while I drink some water. Now, we're going to read 19 through 27. We're in a classroom. We've got to keep reading these passages. And James goes on to write, my dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Therefore, rid yourself of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you that can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says, James says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in the mirror. And after looking at himself, he goes away and just immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law which gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he's heard, but doing it, he will be blessed with what he does. Anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, deceives himself, and his religion is worthless. Religion that our Father, we reference this on Easter, accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and keep oneself from being polluted by the world. So, as we look at this book of James, rich in application, more than theology, those eight verses show that. So let's get this phrase deep in our gut. This will change your life. Say this after me. Quick to listen. Say it louder. Quick to listen. Slow to speak. <laughs> Say it again. Quick to listen. Slow to speak. Now I want this group over here. I'm just making this up as I go. I want you to point at this group and say, be quick to listen. Be quick to listen. Point at them. Now, y'all point back at them and say, yeah, but you be slow to speak. <laughs> I like that. I like that. So I'm just trying to get you to remember this because there's such, it's such a great reminder because we can and we are encouraged to react to things immediately. Because we have instant access to so many forms that we can react immediately. We can talk, but even if not there to talk, we can tweet, we can text, we can post, we can do all these things. And on top of that, we live in the 24-hour news cycle. So I can tell you as a pastor, and I bet you feel the same thing, there is this societal pressure that trickles down to our everyday life that says the opposite of what James says. It says, if you don't say something now, you're not going to be relative. You've got to say something. And so our everyday life just screams the opposite. Every day says, be quick to speak so you can stay relevant. Everybody has to say something. They have to get something out there to keep their followers, to keep the videos going, whatever it might be. There's this constant pressure, and the Bible says just the opposite. It says, wait, listen, get all sides, then pray and listen to the small, still voice of the Spirit, and then and only then do you speak? Maybe. Half the times I think we don't need to say anything and stuff will just go away. We empower it through our words. And we live in this age of rage. So if 
someone goes first, we can just say what we want. And the age where reckless anger and insults is mistaken for courage and conviction. They're not the same thing. And if we're just going out, if we're not practicing this, yes, there's a time to say something and say it with conviction and not apologize for it. But we have to be careful. This is just a nugget of gold if we don't get anything else. Be quick to listen. Wait a minute, let's listen. Let's listen to what's going on. We had a thing happen this week. No, we're not saying a word until we hear the whole story. Because I've been burned too many times. We've got to say something. What are you going to say? What are you going to say? I'm not going to say nothing. You can kiss my behind. I'm not going to say nothing. I shouldn't have said that. I'm sorry. We're going to talk about the tongue in a minute. But it's frustrating, right? You know what I'm feeling. Pastor, what are you going to say? Well, I might not say nothing. I don't care about it. I want to move on, focus on this. So that's a good nugget. So James says to be slow to become angry because your anger will not produce the righteous life that God desires. So finally, James gets to two major lessons of the book in chapter two, and I'm going to read one through 12. If you're with me, say hallelujah. Awesome, man. So Again, we're back in the classroom. We're reading the word. My brothers and sisters, in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. This is back to this issue they had in the church. And James is determined to drive it out. He says, suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes. And a poor man in filthy old clothes comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a seat for you. But say to the poor man, stand here or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, James says, has not God chosen the poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. It is, not, is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones dragging you into court, James says? Are they not the ones blaspheming the noble names of him to which you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you are convicted by the law as a lawbreaker, James says. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said... You shall not commit adultery. Also said, you shall not murder. You do not commit adultery, but maybe you commit murder. You're still a lawbreaker. Speak and act at those who to be judged by the law that gives freedom because the judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Somebody shout hallelujah to that. I'm so glad that God is merciful to me. Incredible words from James. So let's highlight the truth. I feel like this is a strength of our church, but it needs to be reminded, favoritism is a sin. And we have a saying, everybody that walks in those doors starts at 100. I don't care what your background, I don't care what you're into, because we have too long in the church told people, if you'll behave Then we'll let you belong. And then, if you'll behave and then come to believe, then we'll let you belong. And we should say, if we'll come in, we'll let you belong in the sense of you are welcome here. Because I got news flash for you until they come to believe, they can't learn how to behave. (laughs) We got the sequence wrong. We need to start everybody to 100, and that's what James is saying. So, the bigger picture has to do with this place has to be a place where all ground is level at the foot of the cross. We must fight this temptation to treat people according to what they can do for us corporately or individually. Whatever their status is in the world, that we must make it clear that the ground is level at the foot of cross. And you know what I've learned? For people that have financial wealth, that they love Jesus, they don't want it any other way. They want to be treated like everybody else. They don't want to be treated like they're better than anybody else because God has blessed them with wealth and they want to use that as a gift to give away. So we have to keep setting that atmosphere. What we sow, James says, we will reap. 
If we sow judgment towards people, we'll reap judgment from people. We have to decide what we want from God and people and then mirror that for our life. For me, I don't want judgment. I want accountability seasoned with mercy. (laughs) And I, I have this phrase right here. Grace creates a pathway for growth. You know, when I came to RCC, I I text just this week my pastor, Robert Spradley, and he was just on my heart. And I said, Pastor Rob, thank you for believing in me. Thank you for not just 25 years ago, not just seeing what I was, but seeing what I could become. Thank you for framing me in faith and not just my current reality. I would not be before you today if he hadn't done that in my life. Because you know what? Sometimes people can see stuff in you that you can't yet see in yourself. And you need people around you that will frame you in faith and elevate where in your own mind where you think you should go. I had people that told me I could plant a church before I even knew I could do it myself. They were the ones that stoked that seed. Hey, I think you and Lisa are apostolic. I think you could go and plant a church one day. Well, that was news to me. But that was someone who believed in me. And you know what? They were giving me grace. That's how you show grace to people. You frame them in faith. You don't just see what they are. You see what they're become. And you speak to that end. Can I get an amen in here? You do it with your children. You do it with your spouse. Honey, you don't look good right now, but you're going to look better tomorrow. Can I get an amen? You know, somebody asked me this coat. I was having trouble getting it on. I said, was the coat getting smaller or are you getting bigger? I said, well, let's go with faith. I believe the coat's getting smaller. Can I get an amen? Which is a lie, of course. But, um, but you know, you got to speak that over people. Now, I got a couple more passages as we bring this home. Let's read verses 14 through 26. And this gets into that theme about faith and works. What good is it, James said, if my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but no deeds, can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes or daily food. If one says, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about the physical needs, What good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, I have faith, I have deeds. I'll show you my faith without, show me your faith without deeds, and I'll show you my faith, James says, by what I do, my deeds. You believe that there is one God? Good, even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not Father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on an altar? Said he often, uh, you see, altar, he often, you see that his faith and actions were working together. And his faith was completed by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. You see, the person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way, not, was not Rahab the prostitute considered righteous by what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. So, first, this is where we want to put this in a theological frame a little bit. It's sort of like what comes first, the chicken or the egg? What comes first for the Christian? Faith or actions? Relationship or service? Because there is a divine order and it matters a lot. Because you might say, this is what we say, righteousness is the root, holiness is the fruit. Righteousness means right standing before God. It was given to me, it was imputed into me on the cross where I have right standing before God through the blood of Jesus Christ. And through that right standing, a natural byproduct as I walk through this life with God should be living a holy life to the best of my ability. Well, it's kind of the same principle here. You know, James is saying something critical for our Christianity. Faith with no works is dead. 
That because your faith has no influence, it has no purpose, it has no fruit if we do not put actions with our faith. And it is a huge problem in the church today. Because I'm telling you, man, your works need to be connected to the body of Christ. We are in this thing together. And we got to get rid of that cowboy spirit where people just say, I don't need to be connected to anything. Man, we got to get in this thing together. And so James is James preaching salvation through works. Look closely at the language. He is not. He says faith in verse 17. Faith, if not accompanied by action, is dead. In other words, the faith comes first. And actions accompany our faith. He said even about Abraham. Abraham's faith was what? Made complete by what he did. The faith came first, and the faith was proven through the action. The actions flow from faith and relationship, not the other way around. So here's what I think God is saying, though. He says, works authenticate our faith, because you cannot meet Jesus and stay the same. You cannot. He is too powerful. He's too life-changing. And if I see someone who has, says they have faith, but they have no deeds, you know, they went to an altar, they lifted a hand, whatever, and nothing changes in their life. I realize it doesn't all change overnight, but that will make me question if their conversion was real. And secondly, it gives life to our faith, James says. Without action, our faith is just dead. Where are you with this? Is there action with your faith? Can I get an amen? I'm probably preaching to the choir because you're here this morning. Now I'm going to ask the worship team to come back as we end this by just reading verses 1 through 11. And this is a passage in scripture that we should probably all read every week because it is so critical to our life because it has to do with our words. But let's read it. And James, again, he's no anesthesia. He just puts it out here. So let's quiet our hearts and listen to this. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because those who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Here we go. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect able to keep their whole body in check. So first of all, that tells me that my actions flow from my words because my words frame my life. We put bits in the mouth of horses. He says to make them obey us, we can turn a whole animal. Or take ships, for example. Although they, so, or they're large and they're driven by strong winds, they're steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants it to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boast. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of a man's life on fire, and itself is set on fire by hell. All kinds of birds and Reptiles and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by man, but no human being can tame their own tongue. It is a restless evil, James says, full of deadly poison. So with the tongue, we praise God our Father, and with it, curse human beings who've been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring. Somebody say amen. Man, this is one of those passages that probably do us good to just read it once a week. I think this passage and the love passage in Corinthians probably needs to constantly go inside of us. But what I want to encourage you to do, I want you to stand your feet and and as we sing a chorus with the worship team, I want us to think about all these great things that were put inside of us through this teaching before we're dismissed. And I want us to think about our words. Think about taking control, Father, right now in the name of Jesus. 
We want to be a Christian that doesn't have fresh and salt water, that doesn't have blessing and cursing. We want to be unified in our words because we know our words don't just fall to the ground. They go out and they penetrate hearts and minds and circumstances. They create our actions, God. James says, if you're perfect in all that you say, then your actions will be perfect. That's how much our words control us. We want to frame people in faith. We want to honor God. We want nothing but fresh water coming out of our mouth.